For years, Donald Trump's protege in bluster and intimidation has been Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan. Trump even awarded Jim Jordan the Presidential Medal of Freedom for Jordan's service as Trump's defender in Congress and an avatar of Trump's rage. So we are clear here. This award is typically reserved for icons, people like Michael Jordan and Maya Angelou. And Jim Jordan has not passed a single bill in his entire congressional career. Now, Trump endorsed Jordan in his bid for Speaker of the House. And the campaign to make Jim Jordan Speaker of the House has been full of bullying and intimidation. Republicans who opposed Jordan received threatening emails from a Fox News host pressuring them to support Jim Jordan. Multiple Republicans and their spouses received death threats from Trump Jordan supporters. One member of Congress even got evicted from his own office in his home district. And yet none of it has worked, none of it. Instead, all week, we have watched Jim Jordan slowly bleed support in his bid for speaker. That all culminated in today's third floor vote, which saw Mr. Jordan receive the fewest votes of any speaker candidate since the House became a 435 member body in the year 1929. And man, from there, it only got worse. Republicans then met behind closed doors and voted to officially unnominate Jim Jordan, to depose him as their nominee. In today's public speaker vote on the House floor, 25 Republicans broke with their party to oppose Jim Jordan. But behind closed doors, Jim Jordan got 86 votes, which is less than half of the Republican conference. 112 Republicans voted by secret ballot to reject Jim Jordan as their nominee. I told the conference it was an honor to be their um, speaker designee, but I felt it was important that we all, we all know, get an answer to the question if they wanted me to continue in that, um, in that role. And so we put the question to him. They made a different decision. The, the most popular Republican in the United States Congress was just knifed by a secret ballot in a private meeting in the basement of the Capitol. It's as swampy as swamp gets, and Jim Jordan deserved better than that. Did he, though? Jim Jordan's loss is a win for opponents of Trump-style threats and in intimidation, but it is... Definitely not a sign that the Republican Party has its act together. In, fight, in fact, it is quite the opposite. Republicans are now going back to square one. They have no one to replace Jim Jordan. Instead, almost a dozen candidates are actively considering running for that position. It is literally open season in the House. Having gone home for the weekend, I mean, hey, why not? Republicans plan to hold yet another candidate forum behind closed doors next week. The Republican Party is headless, and even its de facto leader is losing his edge. Joining me now are Charlie Dent, former Republican congressman from Pennsylvania and executive director and vice president of the Aspen Institute Congressional Program, and Tim Miller, MSNBC political analyst and writer at large with The Bulwark. Thank you guys both for being here. Charlie, I would love to know, as someone who served in Congress, how Jim Jordan and his allies made such a catastrophic misjudgment of, of his fellow party members' disdain for him? Well, it, it shouldn't be any surprise. I, I served with Jim Jordan. I know him on a personal level. We were friendly, but politically, we were miles apart. And the, the problem is, you know, Jim, Jim Jordan, he came in there really to tear things down. He really wasn't a bridge builder. Most people who ascend to the to leadership positions in the House Republican Conference are out there working with members, trying to help them as best they can. Uh, and, you know, Jordan, that, that was never his style. Uh, and so it should be no surprise to anybody that he was taken down, not by, you know, fringe elements of the party, but I would argue institutionalists, pragmatists, largely members of the House Appropriations Committee, who for years had to endure with, you know, Jim Jordan's attempts to blow up their spending bills. And these are the people who wanted to govern responsibly and do the nation's work, and they... They paid him back these last few days uh, because they said enough. They, they said they'll, they'll only go so far, but they won't do that. Uh, and so I am not at all surprised that Jim Jordan didn't have that goodwill within the conference. Hey, behind closed doors, what, the number of people who opposed him went up by four, fourfold? Well, you know, there's a lot of courage in a secret ballot. So <laughs> I'm not at all surprised by the outcome. Yeah, the, the, the closed door vote, Tim, tells you all you need to know. Uh, having said that, you know, it does look like the campaign of fear and intimidation 
did, did not work this time around. And I, w I wonder if you extrapolate any, any further meaning from that. Well, I think that there is, you know, it's a two-sided coin, right? On the one hand, it's good that Jim Jordan went down. The bullying didn't work. You know, Don Bacon didn't fold because his wife got death threats. And thank goodness for that. Um, I think that there, it shows that there's a limit to these kinds of threats. Um, and, and that, you know, maybe that some in the Republican Party aren't as, aren't as spineless as they might have seemed during the Trump years. So I think all of that is good news and good progress within the Republican conference. On the other hand, going back to the secret ballot, uh, the bullying kind of worked because only 20, some, some uh, 20, 25 people voted against Jim Jordan with their name next to it. But over 100 people voted against him or abstained in the private ballot. So that le uh, leads you to believe that there are a lot of people out there that didn't want to vote for him. But, you know, maybe maybe they weren't intimidated by the bullying per se. Maybe that was one part of it. But I, I think one thing that they were worried about is the voters, uh, their own voters and what their response would be. And I think that is the key element here. I think Donald Trump, you know, was able to weaponize his own voters, his own base voters against these politicians and intimidate them, you know, in some ways by fear, from fear of primaries, but in other ways from fear of physical violence. Um, I don't know that Jim Jordan has the hold over the voters that Donald Trump does. So I, I don't think that this means that, you know, we're out of the woods on this front. Um, but I, I do think it was an encouraging day. Yeah, Tim, to just follow up on that, it feels like this, I, I am certainly not proposing that the age of intimidation is over. <laughs> but I would suggest to you that the person who does it most effectively is Donald Trump. And everyone else sure tries, Jim Jordan included, and maybe even some of the candidates for the Republican presidential nomination. But it's really Trump's thing. And he deploys it to a degree of efficacy that no one else can seem to, to replicate. He does. And he didn't really seem to have his heart in this one. You know, uh, maybe we're in a different place if Trump was really campaigning for Jordan or, or up on the Hill the last few days. Instead, he's been in the courtroom and on the golf course, it seems like. So, you know, he endorsed Jordan, but he didn't seem to put a lot of oomph behind it. And, and Trump, you know, this has been true ever since 2015, right? I, I remember being on cable and discussing Trump, you know, telling the crowd to knock the hell out of them, uh, you know, when it was re with regards to the protesters at his events. And that shocked people. I and mean, that was a that was a sea change in acceptable rhetoric in, in, in our political discourse eight years ago. And he has been honing that skill ever since, obviously culminating January 6th. But I, I expect, you know, if he's going to be the nominee, which it looks like he is, that we're going to see a lot more of that in the coming year. Um, Charlie, let me ask you about what the future is for House Republicans. Just from the outside, it, 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 there, the party is in such profound disarray. I think we have 11 people considering running uh, for speaker. How does this problem get solved among Republicans only? Are Democrats going to have to be involved in the solution here? Or do you think the party can really actually solve this problem on its own? Well, the, the House Republican Conference is deeply fractured. Uh, I've been saying for some time now that Hakeem Jeffries is going to probably have to come in and help solve this problem. Uh, they need a, a basically a bipartisan solution and a power sharing arrangement. What I mean by that, they need to run somebody. It could be Patrick McHenry. If they empower him on a temporary basis, I think they could do that with, with, you know, with Demo some Democratic votes. Uh, they're going to need to do something like that, uh, elect a, a more pragmatic institutionalist Republican, not an election denier, uh, split the committees evenly, just like the Senate did in the last session, where each side had even representation. Republicans control the committees, and if they want to put it to Jordan, maybe give the Democrats chair of the Judiciary Committee just for fun. But they could do all kinds of things uh, to uh, share power. Now, that's, I think Jeffries, he's had to help them on the debt ceiling and the budget agreement, as well as the recent continuing resolution to fund the government. They're going to need his help again. They might as well just accept that reality, because I don't see any particular member right now getting 217 votes from Republicans only. Maybe Tom Member has a shot, but whoever the Republicans were to elect, is going to have to turn around and cut a deal by November 17th to fund the government. They're going to need Jeffries to help them. And they'll probably suffer, the, that individual will suffer the same fate as did McCarthy. So the, the place is deeply fractured. And this is a real fight. You step back, though. This is a fight between the institutionalists and the Trump populist wing of the party. And I'm glad that we're actually having this fight. This fight should have happened years ago. But it's happening now because enough of them are saying, we cannot function like this. That, that populist Trumpian wing is really about you know, tearing things down. It, it doesn't have a policy agenda. These institutionalists actually want to govern, and they want to. They have a. They want a governing philosophy based on ideas. And so, this fight is a good thing. 
Charlie, let me just ask you though, you're, we're putting a lot of stock in the moderates here, right? Pa pushing back, not electing Jordan. They're getting death threats. I mean, it seems like they've been pushed to their limit. Why have they not yet made entreaties to the Democrats? Why is there not a serious sort of migration of moderate Republicans towards a bipartisan, you know, power sharing agreement with Democrats at this point? What's standing in their way? The House has not done business for two weeks. There's, there are urgent matters to attend to. It doesn't look yeah. like the problem can be solved internally. What's stopping them from talking to Democrats in a serious fashion and just being done with this problem? Well, I think they realize that if they take this step, that their political careers may be over. But sometimes you have to risk your job in order to save it. And this is one of those times. You need to save it not just for yourself, but, but for the good of the country and, frankly, the good of the party at the end of the day. So I think that's what the fear is. They know they're going to be savaged and attacked. But, by the way, this bullying, uh, you know, where they sick the— you know, the Steve Bannon wing on all these members and they, the echoes, the echo chambers start screaming at them. That was a complete and utter disaster because these leadership fights typically are family fights. They're inside the room type of deals. These are not meant to be fought out in public. And I think there's a lot of bitterness and resentful. And, you know, going after, say, Don Bacon, you know, he, he used to wear a star on his shoulder. He was a general in the Air Force. That stuff isn't going to work, especially attack his wife. So, I, I think right now that the, the pragmatic members realize that this is their moment. This is a hill to die on. And I think enough of them are going to make those types of overtures. I think Dave Joyce may have already done so. I've not spoken with him, but he's he's been offering this idea of McHenry. He knows he needs Democratic votes. I have a feeling there have been back channel conversations, but nothing public yet.